reading is from the epistle to the Ephesians, beginning in chapter 3. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom all paternity in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Except for Feast of Our Lord and Our Lady, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I do not normally preach on the feast day themes. So maybe history is being made tonight. Beginning tonight, we start to celebrate the feast of the three holy hierarchs. Three bishops whom the church regards as especially to be credited with the preservation of the Christian faith in the fourth century. The Christian church in the fourth century endured many things, one of which was its freedom. With the Edict of Milan in 313, they thought they had troubles up to that point. The trouble, real troubles, were about to begin. Arius would have reduced the Christian faith to a sort of Jesus Unitarianism. That is, a one God with a thin veneer of Jesus over it. And that is to say he would have created modern Christianity early. To repudiate that doctrine took the effort of most of a century. And lots of people put their shoulders to that wheel. But three fathers in particular are credited with its defeat. And those will be my three points tonight. Let's talk tonight about the depth, the height, and the breadth. Let's begin with the depth. Basil of Neo Caesarea in Cappadocia was born in the year 330 and died at the age of 49 in 379, if I've got my math right. I know I got the dates right, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm okay on dates. It's adding and subtracting I have trouble with. Why do we speak about Basil in connection with the depth of the Christian faith? Basil, Basil did his liberal arts studies at Athens, and when he graduated from the academy, he immediately went to the desert and spent much of the rest of his youth as a monk. He wrote the, the rules that are, the long and short rules that are the normal rules of Eastern monasticism. These are the rules that are recommended by name in the last chapter of the Rule of St. Benedict, which is the standard rule for Western monasticism. 
Benedict says in the last chapter of his rule, when you've done all these things, then check out the rule of St. Basil. <laughs> okay. um, Basil eventually left the monastery in order to combat Arianism. He perceived that Arianism, the doctrine of Arianism, was at odds with his own experience of Christ of God, as God's eternal son. He listened closely to the teaching of Arius and said to himself, is this what I experience when as a monk I pray? And he answered, no, I'll be darned if it is. I'm not sure what the Greek for the darned is, but he, he, this is not what I experience. Okay. In other words, the depth of the Christian faith is not adequately addressed by Arianism, which is why Basil sided with uh, the Archbishop of Alexandria, a man by the name of Athanasius, and he fought Arianism in a, at a depth that Athanasius probably couldn't rival. He was far, he was far better educated and far, far, far better skilled in our argumentation. Basil represents the depth of the Christian faith, which is a matter of prayer, contemplation, and especially the ascetical life. And Basil saw Without the ascetical life, there would be no preservation of the Christian faith. That's why for Basil, things like fast days are very important. I mean, in fact, that's pretty standard in the history of the church. You give, you give up, give up the, the two weekly fast days, you give up Lent, you give up these things, you're changing your mind. You're changing your mindset. You're, you're altering the experience of the Christian life. If for long, it won't be the Christian life anymore. Basil labored for the rest of his life till 379, and then he died. Let's talk about the height. And that same year, 330, was born Gregory Nazianzus II, known in the East as Gregory the Theologian. He was a boyhood friend of Basil. He went with Basil to Athens. He graduated from the academy at Athens with Basil. Gregory Nazianzus was not nearly so interested in the active aesthetical life. Um, he was certainly not interested in the politics of the church. In fact, when Basil tried to have him consecrated a bishop of a small town, Gregory packed his bags and headed out of town and hid out for a while. This is, this is all, he treats this in, the, in the, the second of his theological orations. Gregory liked to think. He was a thinker. Now, there's a reason why he's one of three men in the history of the church who are called whole theologos, the theologian. There are only three in the history of the church. We might try to get a fourth one here on, on Newport, but I don't think so. It's just, just three in the history of the church. St. John, the author of the fourth gospel, Gregory Nazianzus, and Simeon, the new theologian, who if I knew it means a thousand years later. That's the most, most recent theologian we've had. Why did he get this name, the theologian? Fighting against Arianism, he realized, would not be successful without a great refinement of thought. And Gregory the theologian was very much given to the study of philosophy. It is arguable that no one understood philosophy, the classical philosophy of, of Athens, at the depth and with the acuity of, uh, of Gregory. 
But he was a retiring man. He, he didn't want to get involved in controversy. But then his friend Basil died in 379. And all of a sudden, it is as though the mantle of Basil had somehow fallen on the shoulders of Gregory. And after Basil's death, he went to Basil's funeral. Someone there at the funeral persuaded him to come down to Constantinople and to be the pastor of the Nicene party. That Nicene party in, in Constantinople, which had fallen completely Aryan otherwise, that Nicene party was about the size of this parish. But they didn't have such a nice church to worship in as we have. They had what we would call today a storefront church. And Sunday by Sunday for two years, Gregory Nazianzus preached in that little church. He preached against Arianism. Gradually, little by little, the congregation began to grow in size. Gregory gave precise, detailed refutations of all heresies against the Christian faith. When we asked the question, who is Jesus, the question, Gregory was able to answer that with a philosophical precision that put this Aryan Unitarianism to shame. He prepared for, in this way, he prepared for the Council of 381, just two years later, the Council of 381, the Second Ecumenical Council, the Council of Constantinople. And he pastored that congregation for those two years, and that, that council elected a new archbishop for Constantinople, and he went back on home to Cappadocia, where he could study and read and pray. One of the other bishops at that council was Gregory of Nyssa, by the way, the younger, younger brother of, of, uh, of St. Basil. That's how the Christian faith was preserved in Cappadocia, Asia Minor, Greece, and Byzantium in the fourth century. Gregory himself lived on until the year 390. He lived exactly 60 years old. The third one will be what I call the breadth of the Christian faith. The breadth of the Christian faith because he was the popular preacher. He was the one that was able to take the Nicene theology, the theology of Basil, the theology of, of, uh, of Gregory, and actually preach on it to ordinary people. He was born in 347. His name was John. He went as a boy, he went out into the Syrian desert. Well, not as a boy, he was a young man, his 20s. He had a very good education in Antioch. He went out to the Syrian desert where he quickly ruined his health with fasting. So this ex-monk came back into, into Antioch and he became the parish priest at Antioch. And people came from miles around to hear him preach. If they had had a radio station in those days, he would have been, you know, he would have been, he'd have been the, he'd have been the big podcast on the, on, on the radio station. In the year 398, this parish priest at Antioch was made the Archbishop of Constantinople, a successor of Gregory Nazianzen. He held this position until his death in the year 407. During the last, from 403 to 407, he was twice exiled, and in fact, died in exile. Um, he surrounded himself with really quite competent people. His chief deacon, for example, was a man by the name of St. John Cashin, the author of the Institutes and, and the Conferences of Cashin, the founder of the, of the large monastery at Marseille, in the south of Gaul, St. John Cashin. His deaconess was a woman by the name of Olympia, 
there's a series of letters between Chrysostom and Olympia, which are still cited uh, today um, to bear witness to the vitality of the church at that time. Chrysostom fell afoul of royalty. He was, he was exiled in 403, was called back, was exiled again in 407, and died in exile. The great merit of Chrysostom is I think the fact that he brought the Nicene Antiochian liturgy from, from, uh, from Antioch over to Constantinople, where it replaced the liturgy of St. Basil. Gregory, Gregory has the answer to both the liturgy of St. Basil in 379. It was replaced in 398 by John Chrysostom. John Chrysostom had a strong sense of what we would call the popularity of the Christian faith. He could preach to anybody and did. And in the, the series, Means series of, uh, of Greek fathers, there's about 20 volumes, single co- uh, small, small print in columns, about 20 volumes of the sermons of St. John Chrysostom. He was a great preacher. Of these three, the most important in the propagation of this faith was certainly John Chrysostom. When we, we Orthodox come to worship every Sunday, and the, the, the prayers we say, the hymnography we use, come from the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, a man who has certainly done more to inform the Christian mind, the Christian heart throughout the centuries, of anybody after the New Testament itself. In these three men, in Basil, Gregory, and John Chrysostom, we perceive the depth, the height, and the breadth of the life in Christ.